Okay, so good morning, Jorge. Good afternoon for those who are in Europe and good, good evening or night for those who are in Asia. So this is uh, one, uh, uh, the May uh, monthly series of uh, the webinar of MRE. And uh, I just um, remind you, uh, uh, uh yeah no it's not this one oh, sorry i just want to remind you exactly what is the purpose of uh today mm -hmm. yeah so emery is a a uh, review that covers all areas of physical science in applied theoretical and experimental research on matter and radiation at extremes. It had a impact factor of 6089, uh, and uh, there are three co editor in chief, Wei Heng Zhan, uh, Michel Koenig, and Ho Kang Mao. And it's open to any uh, paper you want to submit uh, uh, in the next future. And you, uh, we encourage you to submit. Uh, uh, papers. And today, a webinar will be given by uh, Jorge, uh, Jorge Hirsch, a professor at the Department of Physics at the San Diego University since uh, 19, 1987. And he graduated uh, his PhD at the University of Chicago in, nine, in 1980. And his main research interests are Condensed uh, matter physics in theory, superconductivity, ma magnetism, and so on. And he published already uh, 300 research papers, have an energy index of 60, and published a book in English and Spanish. Okay, uh, so uh, at the request of Jorge, if you, unless you have a very urgent question, that would prevent uh, you to understand uh, what is. Uh, uh, in the talk, he would prefer uh, questions at the end of this webinar. Okay, so now it's up to you, Jorge, for your webinar, uh, which title is Are Hydrates Under High Pressure, High Temperature, Superconductor, which is pretty much interesting. Um, uh, yes, this one, yeah. No, no, just a minute. Do, can you see my, my screen now? Or yeah, this is okay now, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, great. Th this is okay. Great. Thanks. So you have 40, 40 minutes and then there will be the questions. Okay. okay. Um, I hope uh, you'll indulge if I go a little mm. over time. Mm. Um, let me let me just uh, actually change uh, a little bit in the sense that if there are questions that, I mean, without go getting into very long discussions, short questions, I would welcome them during the talk for um, okay. presentation. Um, all right, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so let me very briefly tell you what's in my abstract. So the conventional theory of superconductivity predicts that materials with light ions can be high temperature superconductors and hydrogen is the lightest element. So hydrogen rich materials called hydrides under high pressure are expected to be high temperature superconductors even above room temperature. During the past eight years, approximately 15 such materials have been found, apparently confirming theoretical expectations. However, experiments under high pressure are very demanding, as you know, and difficult to interpret. So I will question the validity of the interpretation of the experimental results as evidence that these materials are superconductors, and also argue that if these materials are not superconductors, it has fundamental implications for the understanding of superconductivity in all materials. And uh, these are two papers uh, that we published in MRE on these uh, topics that I will uh, be referring to as well as other work. Um, all right. So let me start with um, um, BCS theory, reminding you that um, Sorry, I'm trying to move something in my screen. BCS theory um, was developed in 1957, and uh, it is a, a theory that says that superconductivity arises from 
exchange of phonons, which means lattice vibrations are essential to superconductivity. So the ions move as the electrons move along and uh, that causes an effective interaction between the electrons that is attractive and that uh, is what is necessary to give superconductivity. And the key consequence of this, that the ions, the ionic motion is involved, is that the critical temperature depends on the mass of the ions in this form. M to the minus one half uh, is the critical temperature is proportional to that. The critical temperature, as we know, is very important. We want to get it as high as possible. So hydrogen is the lightest uh, element. And so there is an expectation that the TC will be higher if there is a lot of hydrogen in the system. And this is what's called the conventional theory of superconductivity. There are other proposed theories to explain some materials, but uh, this is a theory that explains, the, of course, believed to explain the conventional materials that in this graph of critical temperature versus time are shown in green. So conventional materials, were the first ones that were discovered, the elements back in 1911 and onward. And over the years, TC increased slowly. And then the cuprates, which are believed to be governed by a completely different mechanism were discovered. And those are called unconventional, just like the pnictites and other things in different colors. So the green colors here are believed to be conventional and magnesium diboride until uh, the early 2000s was believed to be the highest temperature conventional superconductor. And then what happens in 2015 is that we went into this group of materials that are also believed to be conventional and to become superconducting under very high pressures. And this, as I say, started in 2015 with a seminal paper by Eremets and co-workers uh, titled Conventional Superconductivity at 203 Kelvin at high pressures in the sulfur hydride system, which was a really uh, a breakthrough. And um, in the title itself, as you see, it emphasizes the fact that it is conventional and it explains how it is related to the bardeen cooper schrieffer theory. Um, so we need high frequency phonons, strong electron phonon coupling and a high density of states. So this is, uh, now, I'd like to remind you, for those of you that have been uh, working on superconductivity for a long time, or tell you if you haven't, that before the hydrides, BCS theory had been notoriously unsuccessful in predicting new superconductors. In particular, Bern Matthias, who was a material scientist that discovered hundreds of superconducting materials, he wrote in 1971, I can think of no other field of modern physics in which so much has been predicted without producing a single experimental success. And in particular, BCS theory has not uh, led to a single success in raising in transition temperature. So um, the fact is that continued to be completely true until the year 2015. There are no examples of predictions of BCS theory that were uh, later realized until the year 2015, as I said, because this paper was motivated by a paper back in 2004 by Neil Ashcroft where he was arguing that compounds with hydrogen under pressures would make high temperature superconductors. And more specifically, the uh, Eremitz paper was, um, Drostov and Eremitz was um, motivated by these predictions in 2014 that um, dense hydrogen sulfide would become superconducting. So Eremitz, I believe, was motivated by this first paper to look at this system. And after that, in 2017, there was this theoretical prediction of high TC superconducting in lanthanum and yttrium, and then it was found experimentally, evidence for superconductivity in lanthanum superhydride. Here is another paper, and then in the yttrium system. Um, sorry. So um, again, a theoretical prediction that preceded the experiments. Then in the calcium hydride, the prediction was done even earlier in 2012. And experimentally in 2022, there, was, uh, there were two papers uh, reporting evidence of superconductivity in calcium hydride. 
In 2020, there were papers talking about superconductivity in compounds with carbon, hydrogen, and sulfur in April and May of 2020. And in October 2020, there was a report that this had been found in carbonaceous sulfur hydrate. So here is a graph from a paper uh, published in MRE that summarized in 2021 what was the situation. All these materials had been found with evidence of superconductivity at high temperatures under high pressures. You see the pressures go from 100 GPA to almost 300 GPA, and the temperatures go from, well, low temperatures here, but all the way to actually room temperature, 288 Kelvin, and a lot of compounds with temperatures close to critical temperatures close to room temperature. And the theories, of course, were very interested in this because, as I said, several of these materials were predicted before they had been found. And so the kind of, um, it was concluded that conventional theory is now uh, able to predict superconducting compounds and uh, to a high degree of accuracy based only on the knowledge of their chemical composition. And uh, in MRE, there is this paper in particular that talks about the how useful the theoretical predictions are in finding new superconductors. So, but remember, the, before the high res BCS had been notoriously unsuccessful in predicting new superconductors. And experiments under high pressure, as uh, you know, are very difficult. The samples are very small. The signals are small. Lots of things could go wrong. So there is something called confirmation bias, which uh, is the tendency of people to select information that supports their view, ignoring contrary information, and interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting what they expect. And that is particularly true when it's a desired outcome, and certainly to have superconductivity in materials that uh, were predicted by the conventional theory is a desired outcome, naturally, and it is based on deeply entrenched beliefs, which is, of course, that the BCS theory describes superconductivity in materials. So what is the evidence that there is hydride superconductivity? Well, let me just list resistance measurement is uh, one paper on optical measurements, magnetization measurements, and there is a list of magnetization measurements that was compiled in the same paper in MRE that I will talk about. AC magnetic susceptibility and uh, magnetometry results. And more after this paper was published, there is some results on flux trapping measurements. All of these have problems, I'm going to tell you. So, the first problem that we discussed back in 2020 is about the resistance broadening in magnetic fields. When you apply a magnetic field to a type 2 superconductor, the width of the transition becomes larger. So this is transition uh, resistance versus temperature in magnesium diborite, a conventional superconductor. When you apply magnetic field, the transition temperature is lowered and it, the transition becomes broader both in what are believed to be conventional and unconventional superconductors. So these are the curves of delta T, the width of the transition divided by the TC versus temperature. And they look like this for a variety of conventional materials. And not conventional, what we call standard superconductors, both conventional and unconventional. On the other hand, in uh, hydrides, there is several examples where the transition temperature doesn't change as you apply, sorry, the transition temperature is lowered, but the width of the transition doesn't change. The curves are parallel. And that is really not an explained, it not accounted for by any theory, whether conventional or unconventional, because these are type two superconductors where you start putting in magnetic fields, you, you go into a mixed state, you develop vortices, the transition should broaden. Instead, in these materials, now there is other materials, but it does, where it does broaden, but in these materials, there is no broadening versus magnetic field. In particular for CSH, this compound with carbon, sulfur, and hydrogen, not only doesn't broaden, but it's very, very narrow compared, if you look at the vertical axis, to both all the other superconductors. So this caught our attention, this motivated uh, our beginning to work on this 
the problem. So very recently, actually, there was a report uh, by the same group, Ranga Diaz et al, on superconductivity in an endoplutetium hydrate. And there, there is a curve of resistance versus uh, temperature that's even narrower. If you look at the scale here, 285 to 300, here 294 to 295, the transition is incredibly sharp. If you compare it with the width of the transition in this CSH, the carbon sulfur hydride system, this transition is even 35 times narrower than the one we had pointed out is unphysical because it's much smaller than in any other non-material. And so the width of the transition comes from inhomogeneities and it comes from pressure gradients. And in particular, it's just inconceivable that a transition could be so narrow in a, in a, in a, in a material under pressure in a diamond vessel, and more generally, even if it wasn't under pressure. So I believe there is no question that something like this cannot be due to superconductivity. It's impossible. And so um, here is other examples of the uh, resistance versus temperature for Ranga Diaz uh, and his group work in this is another curve where here it doesn't look so narrow. So you may say here it's okay, it's plausible. In CSH, I showed you curves where it was very narrow. Here again, it's broader. You may say it's okay. Uh, this is another report that uh, the group uh, Dranga Diaz gives in talks of uh, another uh, superconductor at room temperature. This is nitrium. So some of these, the broadening is okay, but some of them it's not. So something is going on in this lab. In this lab, for some reason, the resistance drops, for sure, in some cases, in reasons unrelated to superconductivity. And then you may ask, in other labs where people also see drops in resistance, now they are not so narrow, but they qualitatively don't look very different, whether there is the same reason that causes resistance drops under high pressure in these diamond amber cells over here, would cause it also in the other cases. And if you look more generally at resistance in HCS, which was the first discovered material back in 2014 or 2015, over the last eight years, we see all kinds of behaviors for the same material. For example, in the normal state here, the slope is positive. So the material is a metal, but here the slope is negative with temperature. So it's more like a semiconductor. Then the in this one, it kind of has this very strange behavior. You can see that if we look at pressures around 145 GPA, it goes to zero depending on the material at all kinds of different temperatures. Uh, sometimes it doesn't go to zero in this very recent, in recent work in 2022. It never went to zero, nor in this one. So it's all kinds of behavior in other materials also, there is this strange oscillations that you see in the resistance that are not expected because of superconductivity. So um, going back to this lutetium hydride, one has to wonder about background subtraction because for example, here, they show these curves that seem to show zero resistance. But when you look at the raw data, you find that in fact, the resistance curves look like this. And it's only after you subtract something that they suggest superconductivity. Sometimes we don't know whether subtraction took place or not. In this other paper in the yttrium system, it also looks like it goes to zero, but there was a subtraction. When you take away the subtraction, it actually goes just a 10% drop very far from zero. Uh, this is another thing that happens in lutetium hydride. When you look at the voltage versus current, you find that it's basically continues from zero. There is no critical current and you're very far below TC. In fact, for YBCO and any other superconductor, when you are even close to TC, when you start cooling, there is a region of zero resistance and then it takes off. So um, there is strange things going on in resistance. Now let's talk about magnetic evidence. Um, going back to this list, it is also difficult to know how the data are being processed, whether the background is being subtracted, et cetera. Let me give you one example that we studied very much, the susceptibility measurements in sulfur hydrate. Um, 
they used a user-defined background to subtract the behavior of the background, which is the blue line here. We did an extensive work on this uh, with uh, Dirk van der Marel, and we concluded that it basically impossible that this is measured in the laboratory that with probability mathematically we show larger than 1 minus 10 to minus 338 these data were not measured in the laboratory in fact we can calculate them in our computer and what seems like it's signaling a transition in fact we can calculate in our computer and get the same answer to eight digit accuracy so if we can calculate them, they are not measured with a voltmeter. Now, this is an extreme example, but it illustrates the dangers of just looking at the curves and not looking at what is being subtracted. In this example, by um, the group of Eremets, if you look at these curves of magnetization moment versus magnetic field, um, they are the same quantity. And if we look at these curves, they are for the same temperature. And the curves actually are different. And this is what the actual data look like when we plot them in the same plot. This, these points are from the right and these points are from the left. They are quantitatively and qualitatively different. Now you read in another paper by this group that they had recent improvements in the background subtraction procedure. And they say that this is explained in this paper. However, the paper doesn't explain any of that. And so we actually asked the authors to explain. That was six months ago, and there was no response. We asked the author to send us the raw data to understand what's going on. There was no response either. So there is a clear procedure going on in going from this to this that we don't know what it is. All right. Here is a list of a lot of experiments on magnetic evidence basically all of the experiments that have been done all of them on sulfur hydride and the lanthanum hydride look similar and let me try to explain some of this um, the point is even though the experiment one experiment may look convincing when you look at the relation between all these experiments there is problems so let me start actually with this experiment that was um done by this group or AC susceptibility in sulfur hydride. I wrote a comment on this a couple of years ago saying that this evidence was faulty and there was a reply to the comment. So the evidence was that in the AC susceptibility, there are these drops that were interpreted as superconductivity. I asked for the raw data and I looked at the interval in temperature where these raw data were taking that are the red points here and the raw data themselves are the blue points. So if you look at the raw data, there is a kink here that signals the superconductivity that gets amplified after you subtract. But if you look at this interval in temperature, you see that there is a change in delta T right at the same point where there is a kink in the raw data. And so I pointed this out in my comment. The authors wrote a reply to the comment saying that this actually is not, this change in delta T is not affecting the detection and that there's no relationship between the superconducting signals and the delta T breaks. And all I can say is that I don't understand this because in my mind, there is clearly a relationship between this point and this point. They happen exactly at the same time temperature. So this I would call, I call is an example of confirmation bias because you expect this to show superconductivity. You don't pay attention to this fact that experimentally you're doing something right at the point where you conclude there is superconductivity. Now, let me talk about this uh, very quickly. These are measurements in 2015 and 2022 of magnetization. Well, first of all, uh, so this is in collaboration with uh, Frank Marsiglio, this and a lot of other work. There is no signature in the transition under field cooling, the red curves, and the zero field cooling moment that is not really supposed to be very sample dependent, and these samples were approximately of the same size, is very different. It was much larger back eight years ago than it is now, where the samples are supposedly better and bigger. Uh, in other uh, graphs, we see that magnetization has all kinds of different size drops and the temperature dependence is horizontal, going up here, going down here, and so on. 
The, when we look in detail at the transition, the paper says that there is subtle evidence for the Meissner effect in the field cool curve, but when you look without drawing this blue line, I really see no evidence whatsoever for any Meissner effect. And what you, they also find is that before heating, before the sample is supposed to be superconducting, there is also divergence between the field cooled and the zero field cooled. So what is this? Is this a Meissner effect without superconductivity? Because we know that this is before the sample can be superconducted. Now, let me show you about this nuclear resonance scattering experiment that was supposed to prove superconductivity related to this other experiment. So this was an experiment done back in 2016, where the point was that it was um, claimed that the uh, signal from these resonating nuclei didn't change at, lo at low temperatures because the magnetic field was being kept out of the sample and only at higher temperature did it change. And this was a magnetic field of 0.68 Tesla, a very large field. And so it was concluded, it shows that it doesn't penetrate the sample. That means it's a hard superconductor with a very large critical current. And this is evidence for superconductivity. Now, if we look at this later paper on the same material, you find that you apply a magnetic field, the susceptibility, according to this graph, is negative. It's a superconductor, but then at 100 Tesla or 100 millitesla or so, 0.1 Tesla, it starts to penetrate and magnetization goes down. So if it's a hard superconductor, first of all, it's not expected that the magnetization would turn around so fast. It's expected that it would either decay slowly, like in a type 2 superconductor, or continue to go down as you go beyond the lower critical field. And in addition, as I say, the fact that it penetrates is inconsistent with this experiment where it's claimed not to penetrate. Um, let me show you now the relation with the trap moment experiments. In here, what they do is they apply a magnetic field. And so they first cool, then they apply a magnetic field, and then they remove the field and they measure the moment that has been trapped. And for 0.68 Tesla, the result is that in, under the zero field cooling, about 80% of the maximum moment is trapped. And again, if the magnetic field in this experiment doesn't penetrate for 0.68 Tesla, how can it be that here it not only penetrates, but then when you remove the field, it remains trapped? It's inconsistent. If the field doesn't penetrate, it cannot get trapped. There is another inconsistency here, which is that the behavior of the zero field moment versus a magnetic field is linear. And that is really not possible because according to our understanding of hard superconductors, if you apply the field and then remove it, you get a moment that is going to be proportional to both how far the field was penetrated before you removed it and to the height to the field itself. So it should be quadratic in the field and not linear as it shows. So we wrote a paper in here where we discuss why this is actually evidence against superconductivity, but something else is trapping the moment is not superconductive. Um, more about this graph where um, it's inconsistent with the trapped uh, field because here there is no evidence that the field is penetrating at this value of the field, while here it starts being trapped, so it's penetrated, so cannot be excluded and being trapped. And um, here it continues to be linear with field, so there is no evidence. So here it starts penetrating, but here it's linear without any evidence that anything happens here at the lower critical field. So here's another example I wanted to discuss. These are hysteresis measurements that claim to show the behavior typical of a superconductor. But then when we compare it to the magnetization measurement, and these are on exactly the same samples by the same group, if you put them they are these, I'm going to pick the curve here for 100 Kelvin and the curve here for 100 Kelvin, they look like this. The magnetization from here uh, 
and the hysteresis loop from here are the curves I'm showing here. And this that makes sense. The magnetization curve versus field should join the hysteresis loop, just like in this example, where magnetization joins the hysteresis loop. And so if the magnetization does this, how can you ever get this behavior? So inconsistent. Uh, these are the AC susceptibility measurements for sulfur hydride. Uh, this paper actually is retracted last year, so we won't discuss it any further. So let me discuss the following graphs here. Oh, sorry. Before that, let me uh, mention there is a, one more susceptibility experiment that was published in uh, MRE. This was already three years ago that showed some signal, but the signals are very broad and they really are ambiguous, I think. And these authors have not followed up, so there is no follow-up work that would clarify this behavior. So I have went, I have gone through all the magnetic evidence. Uh, well, not all, but I mean, all the examples, there's more, of course, measurements that I didn't go into. So let me tell you one of the consequences of these from the magnetic measurements, the um, one can extract the London penetration depth. And for these materials, where the experiments have been done, sulfur hydride and lanthanum hydride, when I plot the London penetration depth versus the coherence length that also follows from magnetic measurements, you find that these materials are here. While in all superconductors that we know, they are basically above this dashed line, meaning the following. If the coherence length is short, the Sorry, if the London penetration depth is short, the coherence length is taking off. It becomes very large. And in materials where the coherence length is short, the penetration depth becomes very long. And all materials do this that we know are superconductors. These materials are very anomalous in that they have, according to magnetization measurements, a very small London penetration depth that is only shared by superconductors at a very long coherence length. And in addition, as a function of critical temperatures, you find that these materials have very high critical temperature with very small London penetration depth, while materials with high critical temperatures that we know of has much, much larger London penetration depth. So the behavior looks very, very anomalous. Uh, here is another point I want to raise. If you look at the um, density of states that you extract from the conventional theory from the critical field that comes from the magnetization measurements, the energy gap that you deduce from the critical temperature, you find that this is the density of states. And if you look at what you expect it to be from theory, it's much, much smaller. It's something like a factor of 10 or more factor of 10 smaller what these magnetization measurement would tell you than what you get from the uh, theory, the uh, theoretical understanding of this material. All right, so what is the implications of all of this for the theoretical understanding of superconductivity? So the, this is a recent review article that uh, just came out uh, by a very well-known theorist that basically, again, reinforces that the um, theory is at the predicted levels that these new materials were predicted. In particular, they were designed theoretically, the sulfur hydride, the lanthanum hydride, and the yttrium hydride. So uh, theories believe that they can computationally predict which of these materials the hydrides will be superconducting. And as I already went over this slide, there's high confidence that this is working. And there is a lot of theoretical work where um, people analyze uh, these results using the conventional theory, and they conclude that everything is consistent and um, that theory and experiments are in agreement. And they can explain what is being observed in the hydrides and not only explain that they can predict. So let me do a little bit of logic here. So superhydrates are predicted by the conventional theory. So let me call proposition A. The conventional theory of superconductivity describes superconductivity in nature. And hydrates under high pressure that are predicted to be high TC superconductors are high TC superconductors. So everybody believes that A, the theory of superconductivity, uh, predicts and describes the hydrates. Now, logic tells us that 
following if hydrates are not superconductors not b implies not a so if hydrates are not superconductors then we have a problem with the conventional theory of superconductivity i would like to argue that if once we convince ourselves that there is not superconductivity in hydrates this is an example of uh, Swan's last song in the sense that the most beautiful achievement of BCS theory, in fact, was the last one, and it will imply that we have to basically forget about it. I mean, remember that um, before the hydrides, BCS theory had been notoriously unsuccessful in predicting new superconductors. If that's the case, we would not be able to rely on BCS theory for any superconductivity. What will we do next? I argue that we should go back to the belief that exists originally before BCS theory that perhaps there is a single theory to describe all superconductors. Now, let me remind you, if you look at the periodic table and in BCS theory, you expect that the lowest TC element should have high mass and the highest TC element will have low mass. You find that the periodic table doesn't comply with this at all because you, know, you get low critical temperatures for light elements and high critical temperatures for heavy elements. Let me show you another systematics of the periodic table. That is, if you look at the Hall coefficient, you find that the Hall coefficient is positive for essentially all the elements where there is superconductivity, and it's negative for the elements where there is no superconductivity. It's not a perfect correlation, but it's a very strong correlation that says that you need positive Hall coefficient, which means Hall carriers to get superconductivity. Um, I wrote a paper uh, just a couple of years ago contrasting the predictions of the theory of whole superconductivity with a conventional theory that predicts the superconductivity and hydrates that I invite you to look at. And we have been uh, working on this theory for over 30 years, the theory of whole superconductivity. I don't obviously have time to describe here. Uh, the key is uh, whole conduction in materials, in all materials, in order to give superconductivity. Um, let me just give you a very, very, very quick description of this. It, the theory requires to have nearly full band whole carriers because that leads to a negative effective mass that is essential. When you have a, a Fermi level close to the top of a band, the lattices are unstable, the ions repel, and we have a theoretical analysis that show that the electrons will attract and give you superconductivity. When the Fermi level is at the bottom of the band, the lattices are stable, electrons repel, the ions attract, and you don't get superconductivity. Per Matthias, the um, experiment I talked about before, uh, emphasize very much that crystallographic instability seem to be a necessary condition for high temperature transition temperatures. And that is very clearly related to the fact that you have unstable lattices when you have the Fermi level close to the top of the band. And that is why Matthias found this correlation between instabilities and superconductivity. And pressure can play a very important role in stabilizing unstable lattices, of course, and create favorable conditions. So pressure uh, is a naturally a very useful tool to look for compounds that would be unstable otherwise. But phonons and light ions, according to this theory, are irrelevant. What is relevant is positive hole coefficient, negatively charged anions, and for the atoms to be in close proximity. So let me go through a quick summary and I'll be done. The current consensus is that hydrates are uh, superconductors due to a strong electron phonon interaction and to a high phonon frequency, and that gives their high TC. I gave you some reasons to believe that in fact, there may be 
uh, a problem with that interpretation and that there may be no high temperature superconductivity in high rates. So rather than continuing to looking for signals of superconductivity in more and more different hydrates, it is urgent to settle this question experimentally, to prove experimentally whether or not these materials are superconductors. If they are not superconductors, it will establish that what uh, the conventional theory says, that strong electron phone interaction and high form frequencies are what gives ITC, is not so. They do not give ITC. And if that is the case, there would be no reason to believe that weaker electron phone interaction and lower photon frequency will give NTC. So we would conclude that there are no electron phone superconductors. Now, as I told you before, in this alternative theory, high pressure can play a key role in finding new high temperature superconductors, but we have to look in the right places and those would not be materials with a lot of hydrogen, nor in fact materials with uh, light ions. We want to look for systems that have whole carriers, negatively charged anions in close proximity uh, that would be stabilized by pressure. And that's where we would have a chance to find highest temperature superconductors. All right, I've come to the end of my talk. I think it's about the right time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge. So is there any questions? Very nice, I must admit, I'm far from this field, so I'm not sure to be able to. Dieter, do you have any question? Yeah. Uh, uh... I, I actually have a question. <clears throat> um, so if it is not superconductivity, what is the reason for the uh, uh, steep decrease in, uh, um, in, in resistance in, in the experimental data you showed? Of course, it's a very, very, very valid question, very important question. Um, first of all, let me just uh, say one more time. I think we know for a fact that at least in some of the cases, the, the drops are not due to superconductivity because it just goes against everything we expect for superconductors. So, and quite generally, if in some cases we get drops and it's not due to superconductivity, there is something else going on. Well, these materials are, I mean, these are very difficult experiments. The, the sample is very, very small. It's um, tens of microns or so, it's in, uh, it has hydrogen. Uh, we cannot detect the hydrogen in X-ray experiments. We don't know exactly where it is, but uh, under high pressure, there could be um, lots of things that goes on. In particular, remember resistance changes by many orders of magnitude in materials. There could be very inhomogeneous samples where there is a, uh, paths that develop for the current to go from one place to another. And uh, so like a percolation problem where by applying pressure, you connect some of the paths and suddenly there is a conduction path and the resistance drops, but it doesn't go to zero. I mean, uh, most of these papers don't show us resistivity, they show us resistance. And so there's really no proof that the resistance is clearly smaller in my view than what you would expect for just a metallic path in a, in, a, in, a, in a normal metal at those temperatures. Of course, it has dropped a lot from the previous higher temperature where there was no such metallic path. It was, or, or it was a much smaller region uh, of metallic paths. So, uh, People have observed drops in resistance in many materials and many times in the past, people thought, oh, that's superconductivity on closer, on closer examination. Drops in resistance by itself can be due to many things. And in particular, in these particular experiments, I think um, there is a... Um, the question, do you think it is possible that uh, if, if you require the experimentalists to have more material, then that they don't see this effect anymore? Yes, and that's another thing. Of course, the size of the sample is, is important. There is a limitation on the size when the, um, of course, when the, um, when, when you need to apply very high pressures, you can do it only in very small samples. Now, 
Certainly the lutetium nitrogen, hydride nitrogen material is claimed to be superconducting at very low pressure, like two GPA. And for that, you could have much bigger samples and you don't even need the diamond anvil cells. So it should be really straightforward. And there has been by now, I think like five or six different groups in China that have tried to reproduce these experiments and found that there is no superconductivity. Some of them found there is a resistance drop but no superconductivity in the lutetium hydride. And quite generally, I mean, there's other hydrides where superconductivity was found uh, supposedly around 10, 100 GPA or even less. And for those pressures, you could have considerably larger samples, I think, than what people have been looking at. So yes, I think um, it is urgent to, to look at larger samples and to do careful experiments and to have a good characterization where you can extract the resistivity, okay. not just the resistance and uh, establish uh, whether or not we have any a single example that also should be reproducible, right? Not only in the same lab, but by different labs. And at this point, I don't think we even have reproducibility in a single lab when they do the experiment, they find something, then they do it again, and they find something else. And um, in this latest report of superconductivity lutetium hydride, they tell us that they do exactly the same protocol to make the sample, and only like a third of the samples are superconducting, and the rest is not. And within the ones that are, the width of the transition in that paper changes by a factor of a thousand between two different samples prepared with the same protocol. They attribute when it's broad to inhomogeneity. So how can you suddenly make a sample that's a thousand times more homogeneous than another sample? Um, and this, so, so the, in other, you know, certainly in the cuprates, for example, there were some problems with samples initially, but within a few months, the you know, the, the sample quality had improved very much. And of course, there was no question here. It has been eight or nine years since these class of materials are claimed to be superconducting. The quality of the samples, as I showed you in the graphs of resistance versus temperature, does not seem to be getting better and more reproducible. Okay. Thank you. Any Thank you. other question? Um, hi, um, I have one question. Yes. So I was just wondering, is, is there like any real life application uh, using the, the hydride rich material as a current level of research? Is there any real life application of uh, superconductors uh, of the hydrates in particular? The answer is, uh, except for the latest one, the lutetium hydrogen uh, nitrogen hydride, I would say no, because at pressures of 100 GPA or more, you can uh, do only very small samples. I would say the there's essentially no, no applications. Uh, for the material that was claimed recently at uh, one or two GPA, yes, there would be uh, applications, I believe, in, in a variety of contexts. But I think it's premature to think about applications until we know for a fact whether or not we're talking about real superconductivity. Remember, superconductivity is a very, very qualitatively different state of matter. And so just drops in resistance, the fact that the resistance is dropping by two, three, even four orders magnitude means nothing. Superconductors uh, allow for currents to circulate for years or centuries or millennia, when you have a superconducting ring, the current stays there forever. So it's a qualitative different state of matter. It requires microscopic phase coherence or so quantum mechanics at a microscopic scale. We don't have a proof that these materials are superconductors. And uh, until we do, I think really making a lot of emphasis on, on applications, uh, even though, of course, it's very attractive to think about possible applications of room temperature superconductors is, is, uh, is premature. Now, of course, uh, that's a very strong motivation. If we can really figure out, and I don't think there is any theoretical 
reason why it should not be possible to have high temperature superconductor. And history has shown that Ber Matthias, who was a superconductivity expert, and for many, many years, he found new materials, but he thought that about 25 Kelvin was a limit of superconducting transition temperatures. And now with the cuprates, we're up at 160 Kelvin under pressure or 140 Kelvin at room pressure. So there is no reason if we could go from 20 Kelvin, which we thought was a limit to 140 or 50 Kelvin, that there is a path to room temperature superconductivity, but uh, we need to find it. And as I say, I do not believe it's certainly clear that the path is the hydrates nor uh, other compounds with light elements that people think is a path according to a conventional theory. I should say, I mean, I just continue talking unless you have more questions, I'm happy to, but I should say that one of the reasons that people became, again, enthusiastic about the conventional theory, even before the hydrates, was this material magnesium diborite, which uh, was found to be a conventional superconductor around 40 Kelvin in the year 2001. And that was surprising because uh, it's a very simple material. And so people thought, well, these are fairly light elements, so that is a reason uh, for the high TC. But then they made a lot of predictions based on that materials by using other light elements, and none of those was realized. And in fact, within the theory of whole superconductivity that I mentioned to you, there is a very clear reason why magnesium diborite is a high temperature superconductor, and it is because it has negative ions, the boron minus uh, planes, um, is where the conduction occurs and the Fermi level is right near the top of the bands in the, in the bands that uh, describe the boron minus electrons. And so um, the fact that magnesium diborite is a high temperature superconductor does not surprise me at all, but it does not argue for light elements being the reason for it. So okay. as I say, yes, go ahead. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions? No, but it's time to finish this webinar. Thank you very much for- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, question. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, please. Another question, why high frequency phonon? Uh, a question from the co-share audience. Why high frequency phonon? Well, in the in the conventional theory of superconductivity, the critical temperature is proportional to the frequency of the phonons. So high frequency phonons is the, the frequency, which is proportional to one over the square root of the mass, is the prefactor in the expression for the critical temperature. And the reason being that in the conventional theory, uh, it allows for more ways for the electrons to pair the higher phonon frequency. I, I, I don't think I can give you an intuitive argument. So it's a, so the, the interaction is retarded. So one electron pushes the ion away, another electron benefits from that and is attracted to the first electron. Now, uh, as I say, there is simply, it's a simple mathematical explanation uh, for why when the phonons vibrate at high frequencies, that is more uh, feasible. It's, of course, the theory is complicated and there is other counteracting effect, which is a Coulomb repulsion also becomes uh, more difficult to overcome if the ions, if the frequency is high, because if the frequency is high, the, 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 ion comes back to where it was quickly. And so the repulsion between the electrons starts to play a bigger role. So it's really not clear at all. But uh, as I say, people that do these calculations claim that the high frequency uh, phonon allows for more ways for the electrons to pair, a larger phase space, and uh, that gives a higher TC. And so everybody agrees that that is the prediction of the conventional theory. And that's why. Uh, the focus on hydrogen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, another question? Yes. 
uh, I want to ask something about your whole superconducting uh, superconductivity theory. Yes. Uh, we know that in some material you can get the superconductor by whole doping or electron doping. And the, do the, the filling is not so far away from half filling. What do you mean by whole superconductivity in the electron doped system? Yes, uh, that is a confusion. I mean, you have a theory that says you're near half filling. Uh, we have a completely different interpretation of the experiments on electron doped materials. And uh, we have written several papers on that. The point is, when you dope, they cooperate in the structures where they allow doping with electrons. There are also holes that are induced, and people have done very careful experiments. At the beginning, this wasn't clear, but uh, over the, over the last twenty years or so, there have been several experiments that show that there is conduction by both holes and electrons in the electron doped materials. And it's only when the holes start to dominate the transport that the materials become superconducting. There is magnetotransport experiments, particularly by the group of uh, Rick Green in Maryland and uh, Martin Graven. Um, that show that uh, even though the materials are called electron superconductors, the carriers that are causing the superconductivity are whole carriers. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. It's about time to close this uh, webinar. Thank you very much again, Jorge, for this very interesting uh, Thank you webinar. The... And uh, you are always right. welcome to... Uh, propose papers for uh, to Emery. Yes. Thank, thank you, you to all and uh, see you in the next uh, webinar. It will be June 13th. Goodbye. Goodbye.